everyone. Hope everyone's having a great day. I know I am, especially since we're going to get to hear the wonderful Kevin Klein talk about one of our favorite things, how to conduct a database design review. This is DBA Fundamentals. And as you see on the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you see our, the three leaders' names, Steve Cantrell, Shane O'Neill, and myself, Kevin Wilkie. If you have a need to contact us, please uh, reach out on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to get hold of all of us. Um, in the, or the Twitter handle is right next to our name. As you all know, there are many ways to reach out to DBA Fundamentals uh, on social media. Uh, the first one I want to bring up is if, as you go down the screen, you'll see Meetup, um, where you can reach out to us. And hopefully you found, that's how you found uh, our connection to us um, and on this presentation today. Below that, you'll see our webpage, dbafund.org, where we have listed all of our past presentations, as well as many of our upcoming presentations from wonderful people like Kevin himself. You can also reach out and see us on DBA FunTube, where we have all of our presentations that we've already posted. Uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel on there so that you can be notified whenever we put the latest and greatest presentation out there. You can also watch us on DBA Fun on Twitter. We also have our Slack channel where we talk about different presentations coming up, um, past presentations, as well as just anything uh, we have come to mind. Um, also, on last on the list is LinkedIn, where we have um, decent talkings about various things, SQL and DBA oriented. Uh, I want to make sure everyone knows that all of our presentations are recorded and usually are available within one to two days uh, that you can find us on dbafundtube.com. And like I said, be sure to subscribe to us so you'll be notified right when that happens. And with that, we go to Kevin Klein. Here is his present his uh, bio, and I am sure he'll give a much better talk about everything he has done in much better <laughs> wording than just this. So with that, I turn it over to Kevin. Thanks so much, and I appreciate the invite. It's always good to talk with you all and uh, I'm thrilled to have been able to make friends with all of the organizers of the group and, and many members of the group. So it's it's always a pleasure to come back. Um, for what it's worth, this presentation, how to conduct a database design review, is one of about five or six how-to sessions that I've done in the last few months. Uh, the next one that I have coming up is how to conduct a SQL Server security review. And I'm doing that one with a friend of mine, uh, named um, Brian Kelly. So, but the other ones include things like how to troubleshoot CPU, how to troubleshoot memory, how to troubleshoot IO, how to do a transact SQL code review, um, you know, and look for, for red flags and yellow flags and stored procedure code and queries and things like that. And they're all intended for developers, uh, perhaps lead developers on a team, or DBAs who want to have better control over what goes into production. And so all of these how-to sorts of presentations are kind of built around the idea of uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, you know, it's much harder to fix bad things uh, after they've been out in the wild for some time, rather than um, doing the better course of action, which is to make sure they don't go out into production in poor condition. So that's what this is about. And uh, so naturally, this would be the sort of thing that you and your team would apply while you are designing a database and making sure that it passes muster uh, across these various smell tests that I'm going to show you. Same with all of the other how-to sessions. I think the uh, the secret ingredient of all of these sessions is the fact that I include a really big Transact SQL script library that pretty much automates all of the different checks that I'm going to tell you about. And so we're going to spend most of the time today talking uh, through the demos so that you understand all the code that I'm using to identify different kinds of yellow and red flags. And uh, this will, of course, help you improve your skills, but 
uh, one of the things I always like to do is to pay it forward. So hopefully you will take the knowledge you learn and uh, share it with your teams so that all of us together improve our institutional knowledge. I've been in the business since uh, the mid 80s when I started working at NASA on these brand new things called relational databases. And I was part of the team that built the uh, primarily the water recycling system that's in use in the in the International Space Station. Um, we didn't have we didn't have procedural code back then, so you actually had to use code like Fortran and wrap it around SQL statements if you wanted variables and if statements and while conditions and things like that. So that was that was my specialty. Um, I've written a lot of books over the years. Uh, I've been a Microsoft MVP uh, since the 2003 award cycle. I was one of the founders of PASS and an early president. And today I am a head geek at Solar Winds. And uh, prior to that, I was at SQL Century, if you've ever heard of that company. company. So I'll take just a moment and do a tiny little commercial uh, so that got to pay the mortgage, right? So um, we make uh, about five or six products that are all intended to make your life as a data professional better, okay? Three of them are monitoring products and they are, there's a bit of overlap in each of them, but uh, there's also distinctive sweet spots for each of them. So DPA, uh, data, uh, database performance analysis, is the long-standing monitoring tool for databases at SolarWinds. And it is a, a really, really strong uh, query monitoring and wait stat monitoring system for SQL Server, Azure SQL. And it also works on uh, many other database platforms. So Oracle, Sybase, DB2, and so forth. It's a great way to have a single pane of glass across all of your databases throughout your enterprise. DPM, Database Performance Monitoring, is kind of the new age monitoring. That's for those of you who might be um, more oriented towards Google's site, reliabil site reliability engineer role. It uses the four golden signals that Google developed, um, error rate, latency, concurrency, and throughput, but it also gives you a poll by poll insight into the SQL queries that are running. It also works across all the different, um, I shouldn't say all, but many of the NoSQL platforms like uh, MongoDB and, and Cosmos DB. Entirely SaaS, so it's entirely online. And then there's the product that I've been associated with since 2012, which is SQL Century. And whereas the other products are broad, SQL Century is extremely deep. And so it gives you more information than anything else out there about SQL Server. The idea for SQL Century is that um, you've had to play the blame game too many times where you're responsible for SQL Server. People have called you up and said, hey, your database is down. And you're like, no, it's not down. I've got Management Studio open right here. I'm talking to it. Um, so let's figure out who really is to blame for this. And so it takes you all the way through the OS. You know, it could be the network, right? takes you through um, the hypervisor hosts, hypervisor guests, all the way down to the, the nittiest, grittiest details inside of SQL Server. It's a fantastic, very thorough product. So take a look at these products, if you would. If you don't have a monitoring tool, it would be my honor to give you a demo, get you a long-term trial, and, and get you up and running with these. They will definitely make your life better as a database pro. So having said that, um, let's talk about the agenda and what we're going to do. Uh, basically, I'm going to provide you a series of smell tests, uh, transact SQL code that, you know, we can take a whiff and say, hmm, this is, this is not working as good as I would like. Or, you know, you could say, oh, this is, you know, this is perfect. I like this. So we have these different kinds of tests that we can use and they really de reveal deeper problems inside the database system that was designed. Now, of course, most of you probably are like, okay, you've convinced me, let's do it. But just in case you're a little bit on the fence about why should we do these tests and make them a part of our regular processes for development, um, 
you know, there's some uh, some studies that have been done on uh, both software and on architecture. And I'm going to use the architecture example because it just makes so much sense if you if you've never heard this uh, set of research, which is to say, when we build a house, if we find a, a problem while we're in the blueprint phase, it's extremely cheap to call, uh, to fix. If we find the problem in the design during the construction phase, it's uh, so if we find it on the blueprint, it's about half or a third, you know, it's a fraction of the cost to actually write the, uh, write a piece of code correctly. Uh, if we find it during the construction phase, it costs the same as any other piece of code to write and fix and put into production. If we find it after we roll it out into production, then it's going to cost on average about eight times as much to fix as when we were building the system, we're building the house. So finding the problem early is extremely, extremely important. That's the first reason we want to do this. As a lead DBA in a massive enterprise uh, for many years, one of the things I was finding too is that one of the big issues with uh, developing software is that although people like to use the term, uh, the title software engineer, uh, building software is not an engineering process. When we have an engineering process, say uh, chemical engineering, um, if we uh, apply certain catalysts like heat or water, uh, we know that we can combine certain kinds of chemicals together uh, throughout that process. If we control all those variables, we know at the very end, we will always get the exact same output. Okay, always. That's engineering. But with software, it's much more like um, a rock band or a, an orchestra. You could take the exact same people, the exact same variables, the same requirements, and depending on how people feel and their insights uh, on one day compared to another, uh, you may get very different results one week to another, right? It's much more like a, a artist or a creative type person building something than it is like an engineer producing a guaranteed output. So it's very important for you as the lead data person on your project to really get a good understanding of the skill level of the team involved in building this project because your out, you know, your mileage may vary, as they say about uh, cars, right? You can have very different results on week one compared to, to week 21 in a given year because some people may have learned a lot of new things between the start and the middle of the year. The other really good valuable thing is to do this as a group. And as we're doing now today, things that you're doing during the evaluation and review process help educate each other. And so we improve the institutional knowledge of our teams and also gives us uh, kind of springboards for discussion where we can talk about other elements of the database design and just databases in general that can help us that help us learn more about how it works and how to make it perform well. And also, of course, if you make sure that things are going right early and frequent touch points throughout a project, that can really accelerate it because that can make testing much more successful. That can make the QA uh, process more successful so that it rolls more smoothly throughout all of those. So that's if we have an in-house application that we're building. A lot of the time, though, we buy products. And in a situation like that, when we buy products, we'll find that there's there's choice. There's several different vendors who might give us exactly what we want. And they're built on SQL Server, sometimes Oracle or MySQL or PostgreSQL. By the way, when you, um, you are looking at a product that says, hey, this inventory management system runs equally well on SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, you know, it, it has that kind of uh, marketing it's probably going to run equally crappy on all four of those database platforms because almost always the requirements for those projects don't go to the level of performance requirements. They're only functional requirements. This screen needs to have these fields. It needs to do these sorts of things. Uh, it doesn't say it needs to do these sorts of things in two seconds or less. 
So yeah, it's just barely going to meet the performance uh, standards. And on top of that, uh, when you are working with vendors who run equally well on lots of database platforms, that means they don't have time to specialize and get really, really good at it as a given platform, one to the other, comparing one to the other. So it helps us uh, find any flaws in the design of their databases. It helps us understand the skill level of their team. You might find all kinds of um, very uh, early, you know, kind of novice issues in the code. And if that's the case, then that should help you weight the quality of coding from that company. And the other thing is that it helps you determine who out of two or three or four different competing products might have the best designs. And from that, you can extrapolate the, the best uh, dev teams. And you could probably get an idea of who's going to require the most support calls because of the quality of their code. So this is a very useful and powerful addition to your process to do a database design review, both for in-house applications you're building and when you are making the buy decision to buy a product that runs against a database back end, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna start with the smell tests. And there's a, uh, if you're not familiar with the term, it's basically a, a way of revealing characteristics in your code that illuminate some kind of deeper problem. And what is or isn't a smell test can, can be subjective, it can vary. Uh, certain developers always look for certain things, others ignore that particular issue. They don't think it's as big of a problem. So uh, you'll see a lot of different suggestions for things you should check in a smell test. Um, one example that's a little bit outside of what uh, we're going to talk about today is I have all kinds of uh, Transact SQL code that looks at your Transact SQL naming conventions for stored procedures and functions, uh, for tables, uh, their column names and things like that. So uh, those are in a different set of code uh, in the how to conduct a Transact SQL code review session that I've done. Uh, you can download that from my blog if you want to get all of that uh, Transact SQL code to look at those smell tests as well. So some people, like in my case, I kind of draw a lo logical line between the two, uh, Transact SQL code and a database definition. <clears throat> so. Um, for a database smell test, there's a, a variety of things that we want to make sure either always happen or don't happen. So, uh, for example, when we're defining our uh, primary keys, our foreign keys um, on a table and our indexes, every table should have a primary key. If it has a foreign key, if it has a foreign key type relationship with another table, it needs to have a declared foreign key. Uh, it actually will improve optimizer performance under certain circumstances and with certain kinds of queries that you write. Also, it needs a clustered index. And by the way, your clustered index should not be a GUID. A lot of people like it. And, and in fact, certain ORMs, uh, older versions of Entity Framework, and every version of in hibernate that I'm aware of will by default make the primary key clustered index in the SQL Server database. They'll make it a good and the performance will be uh, very bad as a result of that, particularly for write operations. OK. Um, also, you need to make sure you have the right amount of non clustered indexes on your database design. So non-clustered indexes are very, very helpful for lookups, right? For filtering data and finding data. And we use the term search argument, uh, also sometimes abbreviated as a SARG. So what you want to do is you want to make sure your tables have non-clustered indexes that help with SARGs. And what that means is you want to make sure that you have uh, non-clustered indexes on very frequently referenced columns used in WHERE clauses and JOIN clauses, as well as on foreign key declarations. So if you've declared a foreign key, say in the sales header table, um, there's a customer ID in the sales order header, and there's also a customer table. Well, 
you need to have both the foreign key on the customer ID in the sales order header, and you need to have a non-clustered index on it. Um, when you create a foreign key, SQL Server doesn't create that non-clustered index by default. So make sure you add that. And I'll show you how to tell if that's the case on your, your tables and so forth. Another thing that happens a lot, particularly if um, the users or the, the developers of the DBAs are less experienced it, and they when they find a query that has a missing index warning, they go and create that index. Well, what we find is plenty of times there are duplicate indexes on columns. And so that is counter performing. So that means it makes it can make performance worse. OK, and so that's that's an important um, that's an important issue to keep an eye on. And again, all of these things I'll show you in code in just a moment that will help you figure out if any of these are in play in your database system. Now, within your columns on a table, you want to make sure you're not using some of these naughty data types or good data types in a in a no, no, tisk tisk sort of way. So sometimes you'll see like uh, the variable character kind of columns like varcar and invarcar, but it's one or two bytes in length. Um, I mean, why would you wa ever want to do that? It's just it's just a, not a smart idea. Um, also, there's some seriously deprecated data types as well, image and text as well as SQL variant. Uh, another one called timestamp is very rarely used and they require a ton of special conditional processing by the query optimizer. So those are old school and if possible, you don't want to use those. Also, uh, you want to make sure your foreign keys, if they exist, or different constraints like a check constraint. Um, you want to make sure those are not disabled. And if they're not, if they are enabled, you want to make sure that they're also trusted. Uh, so they can exist, but basically be of no use at all. <clears throat> and then another thing that I find pretty interesting is that um, uh, just based on the way some databases are designed, either the developer or DBA themselves weren't consistent or multiple people designed a database or designed a database, you know, some designed the database and others were writing code against it. And so they have very um, inconsistent names and data types. So again, uh, I'll show you some scripts to help with that sort of thing as well. And then finally, we have a situation where we can have oversized columns. Um, this can really waste space and it can change processing. Uh, some of these we can't tell as well without knowing a lot about the database itself. So for example, if you use uh, varcar max or var in varcar max, SQL Server has to use special processing rules in the optimizer to process any queries referencing those columns you should probably make sure that you absolutely positively have to have it set to max as its data size, as opposed to say 8,000 characters or 4,000 characters. Um, so that's one kind of oversized column. Uh, another kind is when you have, let's say a, a, ca um, a car or in car 5,000. Those are fixed length columns. And so I'll show you some queries that also have um, but tell us what the largest value is in a, you, a table that's in use. And so you can see if you've got a comments column in a table and it's set to car 5,000, well, A, you're going to waste a ton of space. And B, if the largest comment in there is only 500 characters, then why don't we change that to variable character, of course, var car, but also drop the size down to, say, 800 characters or something like that. Uh, so again, the fun part today is to jump into T-SQL. And so let me uh, flip over to Management Studio and we will make this happen. So now we're taking a look at uh, a connection I have to Management Studio. And again, this is already available for you to download. I've got my uh, blog link at the end of this session. This is just, I just start off with a quick query to take a look at all the different types of objects. 
and how they're named in a given database. What I'm looking for is to make sure we don't have something like this, like maybe um, stored procedures that have verb and then, ob, uh, then the noun that it acts upon, so get customer details. But then we have another one that has noun verb, so we have customer update, and then we have create customer. Well, this one doesn't have any underscores, this one does have underscores, and then somebody else has a prefix on it where no one else has used a prefix, so we have USP update cust. Uh, so make sure those names are consistent and reliable. So. For example, now we're starting with different kinds of constraints in um, AdventureWorks. Now we've got, uh, and by the way, you can use the type column if you like to just look at tables or just look at user-defined functions or, or different things like that. So those are different kinds of constraints. Here we've got foreign key constraints. Now we've got um, functions and then procedures, primary keys, and then finally, the type U is for user created tables. So again, oh, look at these. These are a little bit different. Big transaction history, big product. That's a little bit weird. Everything else is more like product. Okay. So maybe I need to inquire about that and find out why one of the devs on the team decided to use that. And they might come back and say, oh, you know what? I was experimenting, uh, trying to get a query to perform well, imagining a day when we had 400 times as many records as we do now. So, you know what, let's just drop those tables. We don't even need them at all. At all. So you can usually find some useful information by just taking a look at all the names. Again, just a plug for another session in the Transact SQL session uh, code review, uh, I've got some scripts in there that actually look at all of your names and make sure they don't have um, characters that you don't want to see in a name, like maybe the tilde or something like that. So I've got other checks as well for that. Oversized column, as I mentioned. So here we're going to compare the column metadata length versus the length of the actual data in the column. And this one has a little bit of procedural code in it. So I'll just execute this whole uh, set of code. Also note, if you use cursors just to read through a set of records one at a time, and you're not going to write to that record and make changes to it directly inside of the cursor, use this syntax. Declare your cursor local fast forward. And depending on the version of SQL Server you're running on, you can get a 20% improvement in performance on those cursors. Crazy, huh? All right, so let's go to the end of this block of code. And as I recall, um, most of the, the databases uh, created by Microsoft are really good. So we don't really have uh, too many issues with, with a lot of these. But in the old days um, of, say, SQL Server 2008 R2, or maybe even SQL Server 2012, my favorite database to use as an example of problematic issues was any one of the databases associated with SharePoint. Uh, you'd see some just crazy, horrible um, constructs inside of those databases. So here we're looking at um, the character length and the maximum length, as well as the actual length of the data that's stored inside of the, the different uh, columns. So for example, we have uh, an error log table, 4,000 character length max, actual largest value is 175. Now this is a variable character, so we probably don't need to change it. Um, but if it was a, a non-variable, you know, if it was a um, in char or char column, then we definitely need to change that because we would be wasting a ton of space in that database, okay? All right, now, this next query is going to show us um, about clustered indexes and non-clustered indexes on all of the tables in a given database. As I mentioned, we typically are going to want um, we are going to want to have those. And so, even if we don't know much about the table, it's good for us to know how many non-clustered indexes we have in that table because there's 
um, a very good chance that you're going to want to have, you know, for one uh, clustered index, you're going to want to have three, four, six non-clustered indexes. So in some cases, I might be looking through this and I say, aha, well, you know, one of my tables here has neither clustered nor non-clustered indexes, uh, you know, and, and the developer told me they were doing that for testing, but I bet those tests failed in terms of performance because they didn't have any indexes. Um, in the same way, you might look at some of these uh, tables and say, you know, I know that a particular table, employee pay history, it's probably, would benefit from several indexes, you know, on date, on the employee ID, on different, you know, uh, things like that. So why doesn't this one have any non-clustered indexes? Let's go take a look at that table and you can suss that out a little bit more. Now, don't forget, just because you, you declared a primary key and by default, it creates a clustered index, uh, don't forget that SQL Server considers those to be different things. And so let's take a look and make sure that our database has primary, um, either has or does not have primary keys. So if we look at to see how many we have in this particular database, AdventureWorks. Let that execute for a moment. We've got three tables that do not have primary keys. Okay, that's a problem, particularly for the um, optimizer. It, that causes issues. Now we can look at foreign keys as well. So tables without foreign keys, do a search for these, and there's quite a few in this database, which logically I know that there's a lot of relationships. So, so for example, product category. Hmm, seems like it's uh, product description. Hmm, product description probably should have at least one foreign key back to the product table, right? So again, we found some things to investigate in this database. In the same way, foreign keys should almost always have a non-clustered index declared with them. And so let's see here, I selected the wrong code. And so in this case, we see there are tables, many more tables that don't have, um, that do have foreign keys, right? But they don't have a declared non-clustered index on those columns. So, wow, I've, I found a big opportunity to tune up this database. Uh, I mentioned that your foreign keys and your check constraints need to be trusted and enabled. So this little query will show us if that's the case. It's not the case, they're all trusted. So that's good. We want a zero result set on that. And then these are the check constraints that tell us whether those check constraints are also not trusted. Okay, good. We got zero back. Now, duplicate indexes. Uh, these can cause a lot of duplicate I.O., particularly for write operations. So they can really, really slow things down quite a lot um, when you're doing an OLTP type database. The reason for that is every time a change is made to the primary, um, to a table, um, every foreign key that uh, relies on that clustered index value has to be changed up because, oh, the pointers going to the new clustered index value now have to be rebuilt or reassigned to the index. So it creates a lot of performance problems. It can cause page splits, page splits even on the intermediate levels of the index, not just the, the lowest level of the index where the data is actually stored. So you'll get a big benefit for write operations. For read operations, the performance hit is less extreme, but it's still there. And the most common way you'll see that is two queries that are essentially written the same way but for whatever reason, because there's two identical indexes on that uh, column referenced in the query, SQL Server has two different execution plans, one referencing the original index and the other referencing its new clone. And so that can cause some problems as well. It's not as bad, but it can happen. So here's a query that looks at our different um, index columns. It looks at, um, their ordinal position, 
and then it joins across some of the system tables for indexes, for objects, and columns. So, by the way, I do a sort by the uh, an order by on the ordinal position here of the objects, uh, the columns that are ret retrieved in the result set. Don't do that in production. That can that can um, hurt you um, somewhere down the line because the table may be changed at a later date and the ordinal position of the result set doesn't work anymore. And so uh, it's OK for a DBA to use these kind of queries or a senior database developer to use these kind of queries. Uh, that break some of the rules, but don't don't put those into production. So yeah, we actually have found that we do have some duplicate uh, a duplicate index here. Okay. Also, you probably remember that SQL Server has this feature called Auto Create Statistics, and it's a very powerful, very wonderful feature. What it does is um, SQL Server watches your workload. And if a particular column that is not indexed is used very, very frequently as a search argument clause, uh, where uh, a, an element in a where clause, an element in a join, um, if it sees that that's happening quite a lot, it says, ah, you know what? I, I see that you actually um, haven't put an index here, but let me start collecting statistics as if it were indexed because you're using it so frequently in search arguments that uh, it's going to help performance. Well, guess what? Indexes can have duplicate statistics as well, partly because you may have manually created them and then SQL Server later on, I'm sorry, particularly because SQL Server created them automatically, and then someone manually came back and created them. And so, again, this is a sort of situation where the performance will degrade if you have these duplicates. So, again, it turns out, yeah, we actually do have one on the due date column of sales order header. So, this particular version of the code actually includes a drop statistic statement to get rid of the duplicate, okay? Notice here too, in a lot of these object properties, there is a, a column basically that says, is MS shipped? That column means, did Microsoft create it that specific way? And if that value is set to yes, you know, a one, meaning true, a lot of times we may not want to tinker with that. So that's why we've come along and said, if the object property is, is it shipped from Microsoft, is off, okay, then we can take action. But if Microsoft said they wanted it that way, I'm probably going to give Microsoft the benefit of the doubt. Okay, so everything I've shown you before is kind of intended to be run while the database is in development, right? It's not actually um, seeing much use outside of the developers. At this two thirds of the way through or three quarters of the way through, there are some other checks that you can do uh, while some real or realistic work is being done on the database to get more insight into some of our smell tests. So I would usually start to apply the this, this block of code uh, when it goes to uh, formalized testing. So looking for things like index warnings, maybe a really good time to make sure that we made sure that we have these indexes that might be called for. So um, there's actually some cool DMVs that we can take advantage of to see if there is any benefit to be had from that. And we even get this um, over on the left-hand side, we get an index advantage value. And the index advantage tells us basically is how much is it gonna help? And so there have been uh, 385,000 database pages that were loaded into the cache that could have benefited from this index existing, right? So it's a pretty big advantage, okay? There's also some perfmon counters that uh, relate directly to bad database design. And so there is a wonderful system stored procedure that I use, personally, I use quite often. In fact, I wrote a, a poster at one time that I still see in different places 
uh, in which I tracked all of the perfmon counters or described all of the perfmon counters that I track. I also talked with um, my colleague at the time, Brent Ozar, and with Bob Ward, who's one of the top people at Microsoft support organization. And um, from that, we made a, uh, from that poster that included all these different perfmon counters. If you're interested, I have a stored procedure that will show you all of the different important perfmon counters that I like to keep track of personally. I also give you um, an, an ideal value, assuming you don't know anything uh, about the actual kind of baseline behavior of the server. So one example might be on um, memory grants pending. If I only had one to, uh, piece of telemetry to track for SQL Server memory pressure, this is the one. Um, the value over, any value over zero is the number of processes, SPIDs, SQL agent jobs, human beings that are waiting for memory to be able to do their work. And so, as you can see, I say the ideal value is zero. Um, so I do have some additional performance kind of uh, scripts and so forth that you can uh, take advantage of. So um, a tiny subset of some of those values that we can pull uh, from the DMOS performance count counters DMV help us know if we have some uh, potential database design issues. For example, forwarded records per second is an issue, a pretty big issue, and it only happens on heaps, that is uh, tables that don't have a clustered index. And so we've got zero of those. That's great. Um, however, if you're buying a product and it runs on Oracle and MySQL and PostgreSQL, well, those data platforms don't use clustered indexes. Uh, they, they don't have forwarded records. Uh, and so, if somebody was really good at writing applications for those databases and then came to SQL Server and wrote an application there, you might see this number huge because they didn't know enough about SQL Server to know that they need to put clustered indexes on all their tables. Okay. I also like to look at uh, the ratio of full table scans to uh, partial range scans or even seeks. So in this case, I just showed you a lookup on the full table scans. Keep in mind, all of these values are since the last restart of SQL Server. I also like to see how much deadlocking we have going on. So if we have a ton of deadlocks happening, then again, we're gonna have problems. And then finally, notice at the end, we have these, these three values, which are, um, best taken together as a group. And what you're looking for is kind of a funnel where we have a large number of batch requests per second. That's, you know, the number of kinds of uh, activities SQL Server is being asked to do. You know, they could be reads or writes, they could be create table, they could be, you know, any number of different options, uh, SQL coding options. But the number of things SQL Server is being asked to do as batch requests, then the number of compiles that happen over time. And that should be a smaller number, maybe half as many as the batch requests per second. And then we have recompiles per second. The um, prior to SQL Server 2016, uh, I should say 2016 and earlier, um, there were a lot of things that would cause SQL code, like a stored procedure, to be loaded into the cache, sit there for a while, it's not evicted, someone else comes along to execute that same stored procedure, SQL Server looks at it and says, oh, you know what, I can't use what's compiled and loaded into the plan cache, I need to recompile. So it forces a recompile before completing that code. And uh, so prior to SQL Server 2016, it was not unusual to see a recompile number that was higher than the compiles per second number. And that is a big red flag that the code quality, particularly for their stored procedures, user-defined functions, maybe triggers, that their code quality is low. So in this case, what I'm looking at here is a nice funnel shape. You know, the uh, 
batch requests per second are um, approximately twice as many as the compiles per second. And then the compiles per second are almost 10 to one for the recompiles per second. So that's, that's not too bad. Um, I might wanna look into it, but again, uh, it's, it's not awful. And this is a SQL Server 2014 instance. So, uh, you know, this, like I said, this ratio looks about right. If I was on a SQL Server 2019 ratio, I'm um, sorry, server, the ratio for recompiles is likely to be extremely low because they fixed all kinds of issues with recompiles on SQL Server with, uh, with a set of improvements called the Intelligent Query, Adaptive Query Processing and Intelligent Query Processing, which basically means we know better now about how recompiles happen and we'll prevent those from happening. Okay, so these are uh, all things that I like to check. They all give me kind of a, a strong feeling for things I need to look into deeper as well as things that could be improved. Uh, now, uh, another thing that I want to make sure everybody knows about is something called implicit conversions, okay? Now, I'll show you an example as well. SQL Server has to explain an implicit conversion, what happens is SQL Server has uh, actually a table that tells us all about what data types are compatible with other data types. So for example, uh, tiny int is compatible with every other kind of int value. So small int, big int, um, what have you. A character and a variable character, uh, are, they're all compatible with each other. Right, so uh, varchar 500 is compatible with uh, a care 300, no problem. However, there are a bunch of data types that seem like on first glance that they are compatible with each other, but they're not. So in, for some reason, instead of um, you know changing code to make sure that they are compatible, well, and it's a lengthy explanation. Drop me an email if you want to know the full explanation why. But um, you would think that it in Varkar, in Varkar, would be completely and 100 um, percent convertible to a um, Varkar, right? But it's not. Uh, the same thing with, say, integers, any of the integer data, data types with any of the floating uh, floating point data types. So number, decimal, uh, money, float, all of those where you can define the, the column as number parenthesis nine comma three, meaning it's nine uh, digits long and the comma says after the decimal point, it has three digits of precision. You'd think that that and an integer would be completely convertible, but they are not. And the reason this is the case is that um, in both of these examples, uh, in, in Varkar versus Varkar, they are different at a binary level. So in Varkar is Unicode, Varkar is standard encoding. So that's uh, four bits versus two bits per element of the string. And as you know, when you're comparing at a at a binary level, an uppercase S with a Unicode uh, text or a character set is binary, very, very different than an uppercase S in a standard encoding uh, character set. So SQL Server has to go behind the scenes and say, oh, I think I know what you mean. Let me convert that for you, implicitly converting it for you, but it sucks up an enormous amount of CPU probably won't use the index if there's a non-clustered index on that column and uh, causes mayhem. So let me turn on my uh, actual execution plans. And again, I'm gonna go ahead and execute these three queries. I haven't done anything except change the way that I am uh, referencing a value for the national ID number. I don't know if it's an integer or a varchar or um, in varchar. So in one case, I've got it just as if it was an integer. Another case, I've got it as if it was a character string. 
And then I have another example of this as a, a Unicode character string. And we execute those, SQL Server says, oh, no worries, I'll take care of converting that for you. So it's an implicit conversion. And then when we look at the, um, the different query plans, what we see is that instead of all of them being 33%, you know, an equal amount of uh, resources required, we see that the very first one has an implicit conversion issue. It takes 37%, so it takes more CPU and other resources, and we even get an error here. We get a, I'm sorry, we get a warning, not an error, right? So it tells us there's an implicit conversion happening in the SQL query. By the way, if you're running old versions of SQL Server, let's say you've got SQL 2012, 2014, make sure you are using the latest versions of Management Studio. Uh, if you're using SQL Server Management Studio 2014, this is a 2014 database we're looking at, we wouldn't see this, um, this warning here. And so by just upgrading SSMS, we'll get more features and they're all backward compatible, so we don't lose anything. And so we also see that we have, in, um, we have some index scans up here when it uses that implicit conversion, whereas when we don't have to use the implicit conversion, we get a nice clean index seek in both of those cases, okay? Now, it could be in uh, database design of your code as well. So let's say, for example, we've got a table called product category, and the category ID here is an integer. But then we have another table called product, and category ID here is variable character 10. And then we write some stored procedures that reference it. So here I'm going to create the tables, then I'm going to insert some data into these tables, and then I'm going to execute some code against these, right? So this basically tells us any time we do a join between these two tables, because the data type is different and the data type is not in, um, explicitly converted, SQL Server will have to implicitly convert it behind the scenes. And they could be in the where clause, they could be in the from, I mean, they could be anywhere. So again, we will get the query results, but the proof is in the execution plan details where we see we've got, actually, uh, by switching around, we have the problem switch from one to the other, uh, one column reference to the other column reference in the join clause. But here we see we have an implicit conversion um, on the, let's see here, in query plan to attack conversion, implicit, yeah. So here it is on the category ID from the first table and then down here. Look at how different the execution plan is as well. And when we go to the second table, it even has an added step in here. And so that is why this one actually costs 6% more uh, than the other variation of it, okay? So this is just a long way of saying that um, your implicit conversion may not be easy to see in all of the database design because the implicit conversions are causing due to variables in stored procedures or in other blocks of code like that. So that's the, the, the problem, the way to find it is, I have a couple queries here. Uh, this one's written by my buddy, Jonathan Cahayas. And uh, what he does is he takes a look inside the active plan cache. So if you have a really busy SQL server, it's possible that you won't detect uh, a lot of the queries that have um, a possibility of having implicit conversions. But if they're active in the plan cache, uh, he looks at the XML and says, is implicit set to true? If so, we can actually see um, all kinds of columns in this table that maybe have um, a problem of implicit conversion. Now, in this particular example, too, it is safe to run in production. Uh, it, 
just might take a while because it's going to look at everything that is in the plan cache. All right. So here we can see there's there's quite a few over time. And here's the ones that I just executed just a minute ago, right? In the in the example demo. So um, this will let you know if there's any queries out there that are are very badly designed, or maybe there's inconsistencies in columns between uh, different data types of columns in different tables. Okay. Uh, along those same lines, uh, a person named Ian Sturk, a consultant out in the UK, uh, wrote a nice little set of code that will look at all the different columns and their attributes in a given database. And if there's any difference in the columns, even things like um, the data type or whether it's nullable or not nullable, things like that, and it will show you those columns that are different. So, for example, this one here has a lowercase n as opposed to an uppercase n, and it's a different length. Okay. That's okay. That won't cause implicit conversions. But if all of these were, well, this one here, name is varchar, right? Whereas every other name here is in varchar. Okay. Any queries that link, you know, that join to another table on name, will have implicit conversions. It's a little bit verbose because if it finds one difference in a column of the name uh, called name, it'll return all the columns called name throughout that uh, database. So it, it can be verbose, but it's it doesn't take long to scan this. And uh, so you can see that there are quite a few where there are small inconsequential differences between the different tables and their data types, but in some places there are important ones that you will find. Okay. All right. So let's wrap up. Remember when you're doing a database design review that we're all friends here together. Uh, do it together with your teammates to improve the quality together, to uh, improve your learning and institutional knowledge and find opportunities to discuss. Maybe you can reveal some questions that no one knows the answer to, but Google is your friend and it'll help you find those answers. Lots of good blog posts concerning all kinds of different aspects of database design, query tuning, and, and things like that. So make sure you have the proper keys, both foreign keys and primary keys. Make sure that you have a clustered index that's designed well. Make sure that your tables have the right indexes, including putting those on foreign keys, putting those on your most common search arguments used in where clauses and join clauses, but none of those are duplicates. And then make sure you have proper and consistent data types, both in the code, the transact SQL that works on the different tables and proper and consistent data types across all the different tables themselves. So uh, with that, a, a couple of things to mention. I mentioned I've got five or six webinars of this type, and my blog is at thwacksolarwinds.com slash members, ke Klein slash blogs. So you can download all my scripts there. Uh, I believe you may need to register at THWAC. It's a big 200,000 person discussion community, but everything there is free. Uh, don't forget Plan Explorer, super powerful uh, query tuning tool. It will show you if you've got implicit conversions happening uh, very, uh, very well. Uh, we've got another uh, tool that SolarWinds built called the um, SQL Plan Warnings. So it would show you like missing index, missing statistics, and implicit conversion warnings from the active cache, plan cache. Um, this and many other presentations are on our YouTube channel, as well as at century1.com slash webinars. I don't think that website is being updated uh, anymore in favor of uh, a SolarWinds website, which is still under construction. But I think from July back, you know, there's a couple, almost 100 or more videos there. And then finally, we have a bunch of ebooks, videos, uh, white papers, and things at century1.com slash resources. So uh, with that, you can also drop me an email or send me a message on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, in fact, that would be doing me a favor if you want to connect on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, so as a technology evangelist, I'm evaluated by how many followers I have. 
So that would be helpful. Um, and so with that, uh, Kevin, I'd like to open it up to you if there are any questions you'd like to um, put my way and maybe they came through in chat or any questions from the attendees. Yep, there's a couple of questions we have. Uh, the first one is how should we go about uh, working with the vendor supported but not necessarily purchased databases? <clears throat> okay, so I, I have to extrapolate from that that you're saying uh, we haven't purchased a, a vendor app, but we have looked at it very closely and we see that there are some issues with it. Wow, okay, that's kind of a tough question. A question. You have no leverage if you haven't purchased the product. So the flip side of that is when um, I as a DBA and my team would look after different databases where we had purchased products and we detected that there was uh, performance problems, we do this kind of research ourselves and we say, aha, here's the smoking gun. Here's this report that's just written terribly we would have leverage because we had a support contract. So we would call them and say, we found a query that performs horribly and um, we need an update. You know, we need a fix to this. And they'd say, uh, well, you can't change our code. That's part of our support deal. It's always part of the support deal that you cannot change their code. Um, and we knew that. So we would say, yeah, but we are paying for support. And if you want to continue to get that revenue, you're gonna need to fix this. So uh, you have some leverage where you can uh, tell vendors, hey, put this in your queue. And again, if they come back and say, well, you know, it'll be two years, or if they come back and say, well, we don't really have a queue or anything like that, that's a humongous red flag. You need to start looking for a replacement to that product. Uh, if they also don't have a queue, then go ahead and change it yourself. I mean, they are, th what they're gonna do is if you call for another support issue where they do um, have some resources to help, they will say, oh, well, you got to switch all these non-standard things back to the standard before we'll give you support. And that's okay to do. I've done that plenty of times. But again, if you don't, uh, if you haven't paid for licenses and you're not paying for support, you have zero leverage. Um, the best you can hope for is to actually troubleshoot that code themselves, offer them an improved version of whatever is giving you the problem, and maybe somebody will have mercy on you and put it into, um, into the next release of the product. Uh, but otherwise, you've got no way to persuade them or intimidate them into uh, making changes. Uh, next one is what is the best modern way of using the timestamp data type? For so an example is like what is what is a better form of it? Right. So timestamp. Uh, the problem with the timestamp data type is it looks like it means the time that something happened, right? So uh, I've got a time I've got a column called timestamp in a particular table that's a log. And so it wants to keep really precise track of time when things happen. Uh, in that case, use a date type two or date time two to get a very precise uh, and best value. Uh, what timestamp really means though, uh, in SQL Server, and it's an artifact that came over from Sybase, it means number of ticks since some weird date, like uh, 1771 or something like that, June 1st, 1721, 1770, something crazy like that. And it's the number of ticks, clock ticks since that time. And uh, that means to have any kind of understanding of what does that value actually mean, you gotta do a lot of math, more math than you would do with dates where you could just use date diff and compare two times that way. So yeah, use uh, date time two for, um, for to track real times. Plus, most importantly, is that um, the values that come out of that column make immediate sense to non-technologists. You know, if you have a business user who pulls a report uh, and they write a query 
against the timestamp column, they're like, what is this? This is junk. I don't understand what this means. Whereas if it's a, a date time two column, then it's a date. Everybody knows what dates are. Hopefully. Anyway. Hopefully, <laughs> yes, thank you. Of course, if you're in Europe, you know, you're like, you crazy Americans, you're so dumb. Why do you put date, um, month, day, year instead of day, month, year? So. You, you've you've got your arguments about format, but still, <laughs> it's a it's a useful usable um, uh, you know way to track dates and times. True. All right. So final question: Is there? And there's a couple of different variations on this one, so I'll come and combine all of them together. Is there any reason that you should ever consider leaving a duplicate index? You know, I, I can't think of one. Uh, you, the only situation where it crosses my mind to even like, oh, maybe I should test that and see, would be if your duplicate indexes were concatenated indexes. So they had more than one column in them. Um, and so um, or the ordinal position that the columns appear in an index can sometimes be um, advantageous. So, and, um, not always, <laughs> but sometimes. So for example, if we have a column on um, customer, uh, customer date, you know, this is the date that the, the, the entity became a customer of our organization. And we had a, um, a column on just customer date. But then we also had a column, I'm sorry, a non-clustered index on customer date followed by customer name. In a sense, those are duplicate indexes because SQL Server can always use the first or the first and the second if there's another version of that index that has less columns. If they're in the same ordinal position, the ones with fewer columns is a duplication of the second one because SQL Server can use uh, columns in order. For, uh, for indexing and search arguments and filtering. The one advantage I could see happening in a situation like that is if it chose to use the smaller index, then it occupies less space in the data cache. However, you do have another index that has one more column in it or two more columns in it um, that would serve perfectly well in terms of um, you know, the statistics that it's keeping tracking of and its cardinality estimates and dis density and the histograms and all that, they'd be identical in terms of that kind of value. But they um, if you had two uh, multi-column indexes, one was one column less or two columns less than another one, you could potentially save a tiny bit of space in the, in the cache. It's about the only thing I could think of that might, might be advantageous. Good yeah. question. Yeah, that's where I was because this is truly where DB, a good performance DBA will make their money just by figuring out which indexes are just awful and which ones need to be redone. So, yeah, exactly. If you're a good index tuner and improver, uh, you can build a career around that. Seriously. Oh, yeah. Easily. Mm hmm. All right, so with that, Kevin, we have come to the end of the questions and our time together. So I do want to thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I know I'm going to reach out and grab those scripts from your website really soon here. And, and hopefully many of our other users will as well. So we do thank you for that. And I know I've learned a couple of things that no, cool. I will be working with and making sure our my users and team members do better from now on with so i do thank you so much for that uh kevin and all the team at uh, database fundamentals thank you guys you know you're doing a service to the community and i appreciate it and i thank you for paying it forward oh our pleasure all right take care and uh, let's do it again soon that's my plan reach out to you every <laughs> at least once a year, so just head That's on. Right. This yep. is what we do. All right. Sounds great. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. Be sure to come back to us next week. I think it's next week. We have another great presentation for you. Till then.
Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.